Um, let's go ahead and convene the Elections Task Force. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Andrew Scott, board vice chair, and joined by uh, Director Julie Bloom Edwards. Uh, and the Director Hollins is also on the task force, who's not going to make it today. Um, I think everyone knows. Introductions, but what we have on today's agenda, it's going to be a relatively brief meeting, but um, we're going to continue our discussion about the um, previous board and district rezoning and the maps. Thank you for joining us again. We're going to have a quick conversation about um, uh, decision making criteria, criteria, and values around zone elections. But um, I was hoping that uh, Director Holland would be here for that conversation. So we may talk, start that conversation today and then continue it in a future meeting. Um, briefly, we're going to talk about timeline for medium and long term electoral changes, but I'm not sure if we have additional time for I'm not sure I asked you all to put that together. So we'll just touch on that as well. And I don't think we have any public comment, Kara. Any public no. comments there? Okay. Let's go ahead and start with the maps. Um, Ethan, I think you've done some work since our last. That's right. Mm -hmm. And we've got, I know in our board materials, we have PPS Plan A2 change layout and PPS Plan A2 main layout. And it was mainly changes to Foley. Right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, to recap where we left off after last session, um, we gravitated toward the plan, which would make relatively minor changes to the existing zones with the idea that, that uh, larger modifications to the zones part of a, a future initiative, a bigger project once some of the high school attendance zone boundaries have been changed. So um, the feedback that I gathered um, were, was under two headings. One was those adjustments to the Northeast and especially to the Northeast zone, so more project that is. And uh, so those have been made and those are reflected in those documents. You can see the new red dashed line on the change PDF on where the new boundary goes. And the, the second thing is uh, might have slipped to notice, but the there's a there's a report, a PDF report that accompanies this, in which there are originally two tables that had data on population and race and ethnicity for the two proposals. That's not just one proposal, the two, so the, the current maps are out there. And I've added a couple extra rows to um, include data that breaks down some of the two or more races category in order to get it who is in that group. Um, and who, who they could be counted with if they wanted to have a more kind of uh, inclusive count of population by race and ethnicity. Thank you. Can can you can you just walk us through that? What you just talked about? Um, mm -hmm. I think I'm on that table there in that report. Ha, ha, so how how to, how to think about this as we go through, right? So so we just looked at zone one, which happens to be mine. Um, so total population is 75,000. We've got broken out um, non-Hispanic by race, white, black, American, Indian, Alaska, Native, Asian, Native, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and other, and then two or more races. Those are exclusive of the other numbers or potentially duplicate? They are because um, there's a variety of different ways you can use to count um, people who are in two or more race. And so, for example, and they're still exclusive the way they're counted here, uh, but you do see like a line now broken out um, for the, the larger, the largest groups within the two or more race categories. So there could be any combination that is up to you know, there's, there's, there's over 70 ways that all the different race and ethnicities can be combined. So it would be white and Asian and black, white and Asian and black and something else, uh, white and Asian and black and white, Hispanic or not Hispanic. Um, so what I've uh, attempted to do there is just capture several large groups, black and white, white and American Indian, white and Asian. and um, you know, one thing you could do, for example, would be to just count those, the people in those lines and add them each time you're counting one of the populations of the race above. Uh, so if you wanted to count the total white population, you could add white plus white plus black plus white plus Asian plus white plus American Indian. And that would give you fuller counting. The same thing, too, if you were to count the population that, that's black, would be black alone, plus the only group there that's called out among multi-race black population is black plus white is the largest one. Um, but we could do that potentially for many, many, many of them. Um, and so I think to give a taste of what that would look like there, I've included, I think just three, maybe three, maybe four actually, three or four of the larger groups. Yeah, just three plus the other population. Right. Yeah. Great, no, that's really, that's helpful. Responsive to some of the more questions we got. 
And so then going back to, and I just, I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance beforehand. So you were saying A2 change layout and main layout. What's the difference between these? Yeah, so the, the main layout, it just gives you a view of where the neighborhoods are in relation to the new boundaries. So the, the neighborhood neighborhoods were a primary consideration when making, deciding where to modify the borders of the existing board member zones. And so that kind of comes across in the main layout. The change layout, um, it, it shows the same information, the same uh, zones as the main layout. But rather than showing the neighborhood boundaries, it superimposes the current existing boundaries. And those are shown in, in red. So one of the things we discussed last time was, for example, that zone two doesn't extend to the river. So you know, in, in our uh, southeast, uh, Southwest Marland is actually part of zone one of the current plans. So um, plan 8.2, plan this iteration of it, does still move um, the boundary of zone two to include that area, and then it, it redraws the area, uh, the area in zone one to include uh, this kind of the uh, Southwest Hills neighborhood. I forget the name of this exact neighborhood association. I could be misspeaking there, but beyond you'll get the the uh, the main map label. Yeah. So the different different you know schemes used to visualize it. I think that the the change map just shows a, a colored boundary on the outside and no shading because in order to, to highlight the, the the red lines where the previous boundaries were whereas the main map uses shading and no boundaries because the boundaries that are shown by the neighborhoods but you're seeing the same same proposal described different ways gotcha Again, dealing with those issues. Just move on every time I switch back and forth. So, one question I have, and you can tell me if this is a likely time to ask it. And it's, a, it's a data question um, that I just I was trying to figure out how it was that the West Side actually has two sevenths of the. Um, Board members, when in most campaigns, you think like 40% of the votes come from the West Side. So, one, and this kind of a little bit came up in the Facebook conversation that I'm kind of watching here is when you have citywide voting, you actually can have out of zone um, voters actually having a disproportionate impact. On like, so because if your turnout is higher, so we go through all this work to like make the zones absolute people by number of individuals, but then if turnout's higher, it could be like actually um, in, uh, Northeast Portland is because they turn out a much higher level. They're actually deciding like who's representing the zone. It's not in Northeast. And I think probably where just my knowing of like like the turnout numbers, the West Side is definitely a way higher turnout than say zone seven. Um, so it's like hey, don't campaign there because like the, the yield is really low. Um, like you only have a limited amount of resources. And I think it probably be worthwhile just to look at that. Um, I hear what you're saying is really interesting. I'm going back to my political science philosophy um, days because I think what, what you're talking about, we, we do represent by we draw these based on, on residents, not based off of voters, right? Or or even based off of voting participation, right? So you could have right. eligible voters versus actual voters. But I, I think the, 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 the political theory there, right, is that we are representing everyone. With And again, again, this is where it gets weird, zone versus you know, district wide, because we come from our zones to represent districts. Um, but I think there's some, it's an interesting point. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have a point of view about yeah, it. Yeah, I know, because just... I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of walking through it just, just verbally. I mean, it's an interesting point, and it is absolutely true. And yet, I would be very concerned about any effort to draw boundaries around voters. 
Yeah, no, I, I it, to me it's more um, relevant to the zone for running by zone versus at, like at large because you could lose your zone, you could lose your zone, and yet win. Yeah. Um, Oh, yeah, no, that, and I think that's, I mean, again, it was created years ago to do exactly that. Um, whether that's happening now or not, or even close, I don't know. I don't, you know, we haven't broken down that with the data. Uh, but yes. Because we, we say um, we represent everybody. And I do think we in general do that. We know our zone best. But oftentimes, like when people reach out, it's like you're my zone. Like I think either there's a, like a low level of awareness of like you actually represent everybody, but people are like you're you're in my zone. You know our schools, therefore you're our advocate, or you're the national person for us to reach out to. So I just wonder if we, I would be interested in doing some data analysis of like. Who, and I know it's different for each election cycle, but who is voting? Because are we through a zone system actually having a smaller segment of population? Um, my guess it's um, older, wealthier, and whiter generally. Who votes? Um, and that's who's who tend to get a more you know, are, they, are they picking in each of the zones, or is like a represent? If you have a diverse zone, is the diverse zone reflected in somebody? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that it's not. I mean, this is one of the issues of why voting matters, right? It's the vote trend because the failure to turn out seeds your vote. Else. Um, and I think that's true everywhere. It's the wider, um, wealthier people, right, who are maybe, you know, who are having more influence. What would be interesting is that if we went to the zone elections, you could have someone on the west side getting elected with far more votes than someone in a different zone, right, where turnout is just lower. So you still might get the 50%, but turnout might be half of what it is in different zone. We don't have that in our large system, but absolutely, people on wherever the higher, highest turnout is, and people may know this, you know, throughout the city. It's um, totally the west side. I mean, and if you look at the demographics, yeah. But I have a feeling. I mean, that I, well, you probably look at the data. Although it depends on what's that. I was going to say, inner east side is very different today than it was twenty years ago. So, yeah. Well. I say, having been involved in legislative races and um, a lot of school races, is like you, you look at it. Where do people go to do walking? They go to the high performing precincts. Like, if you've got to cover the whole city and then with a volunteer campaign with low dollars, like you're going to go to the high performing precincts. I went to these. Pardon? I went to the Indy Center because those are the high performing precincts where people walk. You're not going to outer southeast or North Portland. No. No. Oh. But I'd be interested to see that. I mean, I, this is an interesting conversation. I'd be interested to see the, the inner inner southeast, inner northeast compared to the west side. Because I'll, I'll bet you Irvington turns out pretty hot. Yep. And it's a lot easier to walk. That's the other thing. Um, but I think it's worth Thinking about if we, because I heard a, a definite preference, a lot of folks of like sticking with the at large, but I think it might be worth looking at, like what, how many action votes come from. Okay. I know there was a last um, election cycle because of. Jefferson being on the ballot, um, but there was a higher turnout in the inner northeast. I think it's a great research question for our, our next stage. Um, 
and it should be really easy for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 The question that's being discussed in a lot of quarters. I know that the, the Charter Commission, the Charter Commission is really concerned, concerned with the issue, issue too. There could be some overlap and discussions you want to have with them. I wonder if there's any. Are you following that, Andrew? Which the uh, Charter Commission discussions? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it hasn't taken place yet, but that's one of the things they're very, they're very interested in um, studying further and working with um, National Policy Consensus Center and PSU to kind of explore um, more of those questions. How, what it would mean for equity, what it would mean. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely all kinds of things we could explore if we want to get creative. We, we talked about it. And what this is up. What's going on, you know? And it raises range of voting. It gets confusing, but. Sorry, I didn't mean to keep track. I actually, I think the revised map to, to me makes more sense. Or is it cleaner? Yeah, I don't have questions about it. I think it, it looks like it works. And again, it, it keeps things relatively. Allows us to make the changes we need to make now, but then come back, continue to take up your time in the future. Okay. Great. I'm sorry. So you um, mixed up this map. Go ahead, Jimmy. I have one of those questions. Um, so I was thinking while you were speaking. Uh, Jefferson, that this follows the roughly the Jefferson. No, the, the, so it was, it was kind of option B that we discussed that follows the high school attendance zones. And I think that the question about a Jefferson attendance zone, what that might look like, was one of the issues that we kind of thought wanted people to, one of the reasons we wanted to, to table the other plan, if that was a question. Okay, so that, so if you table or map A is the just slight modification cleaned up with the more neighborhood um, geographic. Yeah, yeah. One of the things yeah. that I, I remember noting in the conversation, conversations last time was that sometimes it's hard to, to describe to you know, groups that voted for you what are the neighborhoods you're in. What what is this geography? How do you describe? You know, so high school attendance zones is kind of one of those, but maybe people aren't really aware of what high school attendance zone they're in if they don't have students in high school. So uh, another, you know, the neighborhoods people are familiar with the neighborhoods they're in. So I think that this is gotten an incremental step closer to being aligned to neighborhoods. And so it'd be easier to say, you know, a list of neighborhoods that each board zone represents. Yeah, I mean, I think this describes it. There's two, like, between two and five, that one, it's exactly one, but otherwise, it seems straightforward. Yeah, so I think, uh, was the next step, so the map is to share with the board. Um, I don't think we need uh, to put it on the agenda item until we come back for the actual final decision. But I think just sharing it as a, uh, you know, this is this is based on all the input so far in the conversations. This is the the, the direction the elections task force is recommending. Um, so if they can have it, I think making if you if you uh, having it available if women was having questions. We have the disaggregated data share. Yeah, it's part of that. So. We you also have all the individuals on that sure the um, comments that file and chose not to share. So, it's a lot. Okay. Do you want me to go ahead and send it to the members and have up to the six? So, this, we, just like through resolution, we change this, and it will be for the next election cycle. Yeah, it might be worth following up with with uh, the county to see if they would still be able to include it before the next election cycle, or whether they're already kind of you know, it's just been around the time that they were hoping to make all the changes that they needed to for the. 
I think we were told we had until. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's all. Um, yeah, so I think the idea is so I can share the information and then I guess I guess what Zan's question is when do we have this scheduled yet? No, no, I'm sorry, do we have the um, resolution for that? I don't see any reason to think because again, these are relatively simple and moving forward, we're getting it done. I think the important thing will be that, and this this allows us to get in compliance with the redistricting and to have a bigger conversation. And I do think like Kate's more that answer to some of the other questions that, that makes it a little bit a little bit easier because there's fewer issues on the table. Is that public, by the way? Uh, no, we put attorney client privilege on that. Is that will that become public though? It seems like um, no, I don't think so. Because it talks about potential yeah. uh, district. Uh, uh, I mean, we can come up with some. Yeah, we can put together a public facing document that's around the campaign finance question. Yeah, or so that's what I was. That's more what I was talking about. It's just like because there seems like to be an interest in doing that. It's like it seems the answer is pretty clear. Um, So maybe, maybe having, I guess, what are we thinking about? We could talk to it at the board meeting or we could have staff put together something short, just basically taking that. Yeah, not the last section, but the other two sections seemed like there was, you know, public discussion in the meeting that it seems like it would be good. It seems like the law is pretty clear. Um, that's that, because then, then you're down to like a pretty limited set of issues. I think so. I don't see any reason to push it back. So, um, since that's all taken care of, yeah. <laughs> um, do you see like the task force continue? Continue like after that, it's past continuing on to like address the, the secondary issue, or do you think that's like, hey, let's we'll get through the budget cycle and like next next fall take it up? Well, let, let, let's talk about that. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm open to suggestions. I do, and actually, this is a good 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 segue into um, decision making criteria and sort of the timeline for the two items um, on the agenda. Uh, I think there's some value of this task force continuing to be just a forum where we can talk about those issues um, and then continue to bring stuff back to the board. I mean, this is one of those issues that the board has to be heavily involved and brought along for the whole thing. I think there is some value, particularly if we you know, if we're able to bring in some, some experts, some other folks to talk about it. Um, I don't see us meeting regularly soon in the interim, because again, I think the last cycle the budget cycle, but I think kicking it back up. Uh, this would be a great summer thing. Well, staff are taking a little hiatus if we wanted to, um, from a board perspective, continue having some of these conversations. Let's sort of skip to the timeline, which again, I think we need to define a little bit more, but, uh, you know, making these changes for 2023, then, um, you know, sort of buys time for a larger process to discuss and engage. Uh, for potential changes for 2025. And I think working backwards the same way, you know, uh, the county basically said big, huge changes, they kind of need them about a year in advance, maybe nine, nine, 10 months in advance. Um, so that works back into you know, call it the summer of 2024. Um, so essentially, essentially two years, you know, two years to sort of think through, and obviously, it would be better for the community from their perspective. Uh, to think through what else we want to do. Again, it's changing those, those elections, changing. And, and a lot of this, I think, I think as we move forward, it's going to be brainstorming, you know, everything that was in those, those bigger buckets can then be divided. What are the things we have authority to do as a district and what are the things that we might want to do for the legislature changes? Yeah, that's what um, I was going to ask about. Uh, 
fall, um, like, you know, sort of setting up for the legislative session, if there are legis some legislative things that we want to do, like, you know, allow 16 to 18 year olds to vote in school board elections. It's like, you know, we can tackle that in the next state session. Yeah, I think I think some of the I think having the conversation now so it informs our election strategy. Future on that done by usually in the early after school starts, but not too late to the fall because or at least have it ready for kindergarten. Yeah. And, and I mean there's an opportunity to join forces with other folks in different coalition like next up. Yeah. And, and, and obviously, yeah. And, and I was going to say, Julie, even given the information that's relatively clear, I think some of our board members might say, put on the rest of the agenda changes for the next five months. Yeah, yeah right. But they like, should know that like, this task force can't change it. <laughs> oh, gosh, that'd be so much easier. <laughs> I'm actually. Yeah. It's, it's fair and I want to see yeah. the changes, but I kind of want a little bit more um, yeah. structure around it. So. Yeah, and I mean, even like campaign finance is like, there's a lot of other parties of people who are involved in campaigns who we probably should. There's a lot of the representative groups, I mean, the advocacy groups, we might have. So I think I think you know as we get into that conversation again separating out sort of I think it starts with a brainstorm you know about broad issues and sort of categorizing them right? but they say even how much interest there is assuming and I think that's interest from the board is useful but interest from the community thinking about how we move into this model maybe that's a good segue what what good nuggets did you get from social media well one of um, it's more like the zone versus at large. So, um, I Part of like part of it is like giving data, and then there's like I think um, maybe in like how we share it out is also sharing out the, um, the demographic demographics generally of the um, of the district because there's like some people saying like the city's getting wider, which I think is demographic data is showing. I mean, that's I know it's on a tangent, but I think that the, the, the geographic patterns are definitely changing. So it's becoming more diffuse, um, which could be in multiple ways. Definitely there's a gentrification angle there. There's also the kind of you know, absence of money for free to move where they, where they wish. So um, both you know both things are going on. It's it is definitely getting harder to draw districts in which you define a community of interest as a race ethnic group uh, because on that basis. Just not the kind of spatial segregation problem that would make that kind of analysis natural. Is that one of the reasons why, and I haven't read the study, but Kate dug out um, that we asked you to, but is that one of the reasons why some of the later scholarship is maybe showing that these at large voting systems might meet or even result in more diverse? Because I'm I'm thinking is, is that sort of a, a byproduct of the gentrification that that it was used to to sort of limit the uh, black vote in particular, if it was, you know, if it was um, concentrated in a particular area, they'd be able to, to elect someone from that zone. But as gentrification has spread that population throughout, like you said, there is no way to draw a boundary. And and, and as, as, you know, I think um, directors Hollins and Green both sort of commented, like it actually the at large allows a black person to vote for any black person in the DNA on ballot. Or so it's just, it's kind of an interesting, I had not thought about that. Of this conversation that, that impact of gentrification may be changing the impact of this type of system. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that that's that's kind of the trend where things are going. I think it is still true that if the, the zones laid out the way they are, they do magnify voices um, you know, that are not a large demographic portion of the city. You know? So, so their zones are they do they don't they, they do differ from the city uh, in systematic ways from the city overall. Um, I, I think that. We saw that challenge when you know some interest groups were, were asking could they define like majority minority districts and that specifically that is kind of impossible to do but you still can draw them in such a way that, that you are magnifying the voices so that we see in some industries here on the gameways we have a larger uh, presence of, of like black folks for example um, so i think it would be interesting when like we advanced like just the demographics, the disaggregated demographics of the current zones, which is the, the new zones, and then just like the overall aggregate. Um, so people will like understand like what's happening, like what the within our PPS boundaries, what the census data shows in terms of what our demographics. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is maybe like add a new table or fields to the table that would show the overall district or the overall demographics of the, of the district and then maybe some measure and some indication of, of what are the differences for each of the board zone uh, member areas from the district overall like the plus or minus you do that yeah yeah i mean it'd be interesting just like compare the city because the city is getting more diverse but i wonder if yes because we end at the closer in eastern um Edge of East County, um, that where there's more diversity now, whether actually the, that the public is actually, it's actually happening outside. PPS is not being, so it's the well, city of Portland is, but it's outside of PPS as well. Yeah. I know our poverty rate is going has been. Um, so even I think I heard you say that you could add. Yeah, I can add a table. It's kind of responsive to that discussion. It's overall demographics and what was the other second. And then the one that kind of shows the deviation for for a particular board members and area. Um, where, where is it different? How how is it different? Than the overall. Yeah. So let's uh, spend just a couple minutes um, starting the conversation around um, decision making criteria. And I think we'll have plenty of time to get into this um, as we go forward. But, and, and Ethan, you could perhaps help with this given some of your other work. I mean, it seems like there's some really, there's some obvious legal stuff, right? So we need to think about criteria of the zones. Um, it has to be the population or the certain population. Um, you know, we often refer to the scholarship often refers to communities of interest. I mean, how you define that gets challenging. Right? There's lots of different ways to define it. Um, you know, we've talked about neighborhood boundaries, and that's well, actually, I guess let me ask if they, you know, because these zones we've sort of just inherited, so I don't know how good a job they do. On the west side, they do, because there's only two of them. Um, but I don't know on the east side how good a job they do of sort of defining, drawing boundaries around existing neighborhoods versus, versus maybe they were drawn years ago in the neighborhood. You know, it's changed quite a bit in terms of student development and how it feels. Um, but communities of interest, and, and then that gets to the whole question of, you know, do we in the future want to move towards, you know, a conversation around school zones versus not? Joe, I thought you made an interesting point, right? We sort of think about it, it's a school district. So maybe we should align those those zones with high schools. Um, I think there's some, you know, some people do think about that. Even even people who don't have kids, I think know, you know, that their neighbors' kids go to Franklin or Jefferson or Henry Wells. Um, but uh, but I'm not sure. That, you know, if 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 the if the high school boundary, you know, bisects a neighborhood, then people may think that that's more of a community of interest than the high school. And I don't know how we weigh those sort of moving forward. 
conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think it's good. It's going to be interesting what happens with the full conversations about this. Um, because depending on how long you've been in Portland, like it is, I mean, I, like I still have a hard time thinking like I'm in the thing in some sense because that's not because I live in the house I grew up in and that's not where I went to high school. And it depends on how big of a shift that has to be But I think that's, I think that definitely is a community of interest in, in most neighborhoods. Let me just say, I see most of them. Yeah. Um, this is sort of a legal question, so you don't have to answer it if you don't want to or don't know. Um, but what are the restrictions on? Using race as a factor in drawing controls. Yeah, so I know in California there, there are some rules that speak to that. I don't know if any in Oregon, um, when you're asking about you know, legal requirements, actually came to mind is one of the things kind of unique about ERS um, sections on school board zone redistricting is that it actually does call out dependent zones. Um, that, you know, so it's ORS 332.132, and it does say that. The zones uh, should be drawn or data from the federal census and as practical, taking into account attendance areas when possible. So I think that I haven't seen that. Uh, things like that being specifically called out in other redistricting projects for free SDs or for, for counties or cities. Well, things are different, but uh, I think that's kind of that's one unique thing. But um, no, I think on the contrary, like the expectation is that, that race and ethnicity are taken into consideration doing redistricting. That's why they're um, put out with that redistricting data file. The only things it does contain are voting age population and, and race and ethnicity detail. So um, I think because the concern has been so long that they both were suppressed on the basis of race and ethnicity that they want to make it sure that, that they can be, that, that, that assertions that that's happening again can be tested. I guess I'm curious, and maybe Kate, this is something to look into a little bit for the future. Like, I thought there were some Supreme Court cases around the Voting Rights Act, and that when race had explicitly been used as when when legislatures had explicitly used race to gerrymander districts, that that had been something that would fall afoul of the Voting Rights Act. But I think the Supreme Court got it. A couple of different provisions of that act through recent decisions. Um, so I, I, I raise it more just as you know, are we okay as a body having a very open conversation about drawing boundaries, you know, using race as one of the criteria? It sounds like we probably are, but just knowing that going forward so we don't accidentally trip or something, get a challenge. So it seems like. I'm wondering, instead of us having the sort of plow in the ground, if with charter commission has done a lot of this already, it's the same issues. I think they're looking at the community, like our, our, our community, well, the community of interest we have in the district cities is the, the school, the, the school down, high school boundaries. But other than that, I think a lot of the business is the community. Um, and so communities of interest would be. I can take a look. I think they put out like three sort of interim reports so far about public comment and where they are. Yeah, so I can review that stuff. Yeah, and, and I think the current work is would be really good, and, and both legal and focus the city about it. It's honest. Great. I think it's a good. I think we'll need to come back to the values as we talk about sort of the changes and just maybe even have a board conversation in some future about what are the criteria. Because there's lots of different things that result in different outcomes. So we, you know, if we do make some of those big changes, even even if we keep the at large but make changes to sort of high school boundaries, that'll be. And if we make you know, changes, I mean, there's 
and I don't know how you get out, so I look at like uh, zone seven, and you probably have some of the wealthiest zip codes and, and the lowest income zip codes in the city in that in one zone. Um, you know, so like, are you ever going to get somebody from the very eastern portion of the of zone seven um, versus the close in western? I mean, just if I look at all the zones, that's the one that probably has the biggest stretch in terms of just uh, income by zip code. That's yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, let's return really quickly just to wrap up because um, you had sort of said, and the reason I'm sorry, the reason why that's somewhat relevant is if I look at from a race and ethnicity standpoint, the, um, the zip codes in outer southeast from 82nd division on, there is um, the largest concentration in the city now of um, AAPI um, community, so the J district. So if you were looking at representation um, from that community, but then you look at, they're also linked to the so Eastmoreland and Hope College. Like my recollection of like who's been elected that district, it's always been somebody from the western most uh, portion of the district versus uh, what would be a, a really diverse portion of that. So sorry. That was this. Um you had said earlier that, you know, well, actually, a little, again, sort of with the, the, the memo and sort of the campaign finance stuff, maybe it's a little bit clear. Thinking about those future things, even if we want legislative strategy, the things that I've heard folks bring up are um, campaign finance, whether we want to do some sort of either you know, limitations, which I think would require um, a constitutional change, or um, some sort of public finance program, which would require legislative change. Um, we talked about student voting and or youth voting, I should say, at least students um, of some kind. Um, I think we'll want to return back to this zone versus that large conversation as we engage the community, uh, just to get, you know, I think we heard from the board, but I think it'll be good to really go to the community a little bit and, and hear from them as well. Um, anything else on that meeting or long-term list? I feel like there was something else from before. Forget it. Yeah, that's sort of, yeah, I got the campaign finance here, the school aspects of it. your donations and federal finance. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't see how you do. Um, oh, I remember, sorry. I'm documenting it. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Sort of non, non citizen. Yeah, city New York City, I think, just. Yeah, I thought, didn't, um, didn't San Francisco School District, or maybe LA, I think, didn't San Francisco or LA, I think. I'm assuming that requires a legislative Okay. I don't think we need to schedule a meeting. I think we're coming back to the board. Um, this in April, and then soon it passes. Um, then we can talk about the next um, It would be great if you could put it on the uh, next week or so. Don't go too long. Any other business questions? The prompt. Late start. On the PAC. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your work, too. It's been really great.